I would like to say Boyana to the organizers for inviting us to present today. Um, I think bringing together Indigenous people's knowledge systems and science, you know, has been increasingly recognized as needed, especially given the face of climate change and many of the changes we're seeing today. A holistic image is attained by bringing Indigenous people's knowledge holders and scientists together through a co-production of knowledge framework. And so while this presentation today may be focused largely on research type activities, it could also be applied in the context of policy making or resource management. So keep that in mind as we go through the presentation. And so today we wanted to share with you a model that we've collectively developed on the co-production of knowledge and what we think a co-production of knowledge framework should look like. I think it's important to point out that this model is based on our collective experiences and our shared networks. And so it's largely informed and coming from an indigenous Arctic perspective. Uh, thank you, Rochelle. And, and just for those uh, that are on um, that might not realize, um, so that specifically this work uh, is being presented by myself, Rochelle and Julie Raymond Yakopian. Okay, so today we want to discuss a co-production of knowledge, as Rochelle said, between indigenous people's knowledge systems and science. To begin, it is important that we all recognize that these are two different knowledge systems that, uh, that hold their own methodologies, evaluation, and analysis processes. Oftentimes, um, we're asking two different questions, and that's a good thing. We need both questions to understand a lot of things that are occurring. So while we go through this discussion, we ask all of you to recognize that these are two different knowledge systems. This is different from a multidisciplinary work where multiple science disciplines are brought together. This is also different from bringing together decision makers and scientists. A key to a co-production of knowledge is understanding that it is a process. A process where knowledge holders work together from inception to analysis and output, where both knowledge systems are respected for what they are, where experts from both knowledge systems are trusted respected for the information that they bring to the table, their interpretation of that information for their way of viewing life, for their culture, and for a process that will bring about a greater understanding. To achieve this, it's important not to translate one knowledge system into the other. Also to achieve this, we have to address the issue of equity and the pieces that make up equity. So we wanted to uh, walk you through this model that we've developed today from the center to the middle. And um, what we're calling this is a, a co-production of knowledge conceptual model. And in the very center there, you can see on your screen um, the letter CPK, -E and that represents co-production of knowledge. And surrounding that goal are basic components to a co-production of knowledge process. And surrounding those in the, the darker blue are the tools that we need to get to that place of co-production of knowledge. And those tools also bring us to the concept of equity, which is what's surrounding this entire conceptual model. And so we'll take you step by step through this, through this whole model now. So as Julie mentioned, many of these tools, you know, combined together you know, will help, um, you know, provide for you, you know, a process. And I think it's important to, uh, you know, point out that this is a process and it's not something that go from step one to step two to step three and you don't revisit these steps throughout, the, throughout your process. You need to revisit them and go back and ensure that you're addressing, you know, each of these different components um, throughout your whole process. And uh, you during one of our presentations in the past, um, we, you know, had several questions from a scientist that, you know, had a, you know, he was, had a really hard time understanding that, you know, that this was something that, you know, you didn't just check off a box. But then, you know, once we went through the model, both the components and the process pieces, he understood that, no, this is why a lot of research hasn't worked in the past and it won't work until you address that systematic issue of equity. And so in order to ensure that 
you know, each of these components are adequately addressed, this issue of equity, ensuring that all players, including knowledge holders, indigenous knowledge holders, and scientists have the same opportunities and access to the same tools. And so this is going to be a theme throughout this whole presentation. So here's the conceptual model again, and um, Rochelle was again just talking about equity, the what we have kind of as the outer circle of the model. Um, everything that we do inside the circle has to be based on that concept of equity. So the next concept that I wanted to talk briefly about is relationships. And relationships are crucially important, as we all know, for anything that we do, but including research activities, which is kind of what we're focusing on here today. And building a relationship requires learning and understanding each other's knowledge systems, each other's motivations, and each other's goals. And cultivating strong relationships is a process that takes time, and it involves the participation of both parties in this co-production of knowledge process. And it must be continuously cultivated in order to effectively work together. So that also ties back to what Rachel was saying about needing to constantly revisit all the different parts of this process. Um, you can't develop a relationship with someone as part of the co-production of knowledge process or any other process, ignore it for months or years on end and then try and come back and um, you know, be best friends again. You, you need to continuously cultivate that relationship and make sure that everyone is on the same page and in the context of what we're talking about, that everyone understands motivations and goals and what's driving the actual process of co-production from both sides. So also, also on that slide, uh, on that conceptual model, you'll notice the empowerment. And here we're really talking about the need to make, make political and intellectual space for indigenous peoples to have power and authority. It is necessary to recognize that there are power dynamics at play and to actively work to create a balance through the empowerment of indigenous peoples. And another, uh, another component on that outer ring is capacity. And so when we talk about capacity, we're saying that it's necessary to build capacity for both indigenous peoples and for the research community. So for indigenous peoples, this includes the means and ability for indigenous peoples to participate in the co-production of knowledge process. And so again, you know, that relates back to that, you know, equity process, it relates back to equity and ensuring that this whole process includes the tools and the means for indigenous people to be able to participate as co-PIs throughout the whole process. <clears throat> So for the research community, this might include education on indigenous peoples, their cosmologies, histories, you know, value systems, concerns, methodologies, for example. The next part of the model that uh, I'm gonna talk about is being deliberate and intentional. And to be involved in a co-production of knowledge process, everyone miss, must make a deliberate choice to do so. It's kind of hard to, you know, accidentally become involved in co-production of knowledge um, because it's based on important concepts like equity. It has to be something that people agree to participate in together. And because of that, participants should strive to always be conscious of the shared understandings and intent of the collaborative approach. Decision making within that approach should also be intentional and exclusive. So of course not every process starts out with people sitting down and saying let's do co-production. Um, sometimes that kind of evolves as part of the relationship but um, because these concepts are being talked about more widely and indigenous peoples are <laughs> demanding and asking to be involved in research, for example, in a co-productive way. Uh, we, we think it's important and fruitful that as researchers, if this process is something you want to engage in, and we hope that you do, that it, you will go about it in a, 
intentional and deliberate way and have these conversations upfront with your partners and collaborators. <clears throat> the next concept in the model um, that we want to touch on is the idea of ethics or being ethical. Community ethical practices need to be followed. And ethical practices really need to be at the center of the relationships between indigenous communities and the research community. Communities ethical guidelines or principles should be followed, as should established disciplinary ethical guidelines. The ethical principles being implemented in a co-production relationship should be agreed upon by all participants before work begins. So for example, what we mean by that is that we should be sitting down with our co-PIs and our collaborators uh, in any instance, I think, but particularly in a co-production of knowledge instance and talking about what are the guidelines and principles that we are going to all agree to follow as part of this process. Um, communities may have their own ethical guidelines or principles for conduct. Um, your discipline may have them. Uh, there may be other broader ones that you follow, <coughs> the principles for conduct of research in the Arctic. Uh, whatever they are, all of this should be discussed ahead of time and everyone should agree to follow them. And of course, you should revisit that periodically to make sure everyone is and to talk about uh, whether or not they're still working for the work that you're doing. So the next component that I would like to touch on is decolonization. And this is a concept that many indigenous people are very familiar with and, and it's something very important. But we've received a lot of questions from you know, a lot of scientists you know, about what, what this means. And, and that's okay because that's good to understand um, you know, where, what, what's important and you know, the history of um, indigenous peoples. And so indigenous peoples have a way of knowing and understanding the world that's very different from predominant, predominant mainstream systems. Many processes and many frameworks, you know, have been imposed on indigenous communities without including or even purposefully excluding indigenous ways of being and knowing, you know, such as education systems, justice systems, decision-making frameworks, and even um, research research and research protocols. There are many indigenous processes and approaches that are still in existence today and are regularly practiced. For example, you know, hunting, hunting practices, the process of grieving, education systems, and again, justice systems. So to work within a co-production framework, indigenous frameworks, processes, and methodologies will need to be equitable with those from Western and scientific approaches. And, you know, this is something we're happy to talk about more um, in the Q&A as well. So the next component of our model um, is sovereignty. And sovereignty is a very important component uh, a, as an Indigenous person. Um, indigenous peoples have inherent sovereign rights over their own knowledge. And free prior and informed consent on issues, whether it's natural resource management, whether it's research, whether it's um, policy. If it concerns indigenous lands, waters, and air, the surrounding environment that helps support a way of life, you know, is an essential part to this and very important to consider. So the next part that we want to talk about is trust and respect, and we kind of touched upon this in the introduction, but working together requires trust and respect. This is a key part to this approach, is that we respect each other's knowledge sources as its own and move away from attempting to translate one knowledge into the other. Trust that when Indigenous peoples are speaking about and have the ability to analyze their own information and respect that each of us comes to the table with the credentials needed to be there. For the, some, this may mean you come to the table with degrees or publications. And for others, this may mean a lifetime as being a hunter, a gatherer, or an elder. Respect each other's cultures. This includes ways of communicating, respect each other's thought processes, philosophies, and cosmologies. It seems like, a, it seems like an easy thing to say to trust and respect, uh, but we see this continuously lacking at tables of even 
even at tables where there's intent to uh, to collaborate, um, there still is this power dynamic that that gets connected back to that lack of trust and respect. So next, we wanted to go through, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the inner ring of the conceptual model. And as I think Carolina mentioned before, we really want you to not think about these next components as linear steps in a project, but more as a process. And really want you to think about how the components <clears throat> that bring equity to the table should be revisited regularly throughout the co-production of knowledge process. So looking looking at this inner inner ring, or also in in thinking about all of these pieces, we have access and control of information. So it's really important to recognize that there are sovereign rights of indigenous peoples should be respected when determining access and control of information that derives from a co-production of knowledge. Indigenous peoples need to fully understand the risk and opportunities to participating in a research project. project to cons consent also includes the right not to participate in a project, the right not to include their information. Um, who has, they also have a right to have uh, a say in who has access to and control of the information, data, and products, how it is stored and where it is stored, what the agreements are for future use. All of these questions and, and others need to be collectively discussed and agreed upon before beginning the work. Okay, and as Carolina said, and Julie mentioned that we are going through that inner ring, and um, the next thing I'd like to talk about is communications. And this has several aspects. So one of these is ensuring that there's an open and transparent communication process throughout, throughout the whole co-production knowledge process among the leads and the co-PIs, including uh, the indigenous um, people's knowledge experts as well as scientists. Um, so for the researcher, it might be important to have a good understanding of the lay of the land in the region, you know, where you might be do working. Um, with that knowledge, you know, you could gain helpful hints such as leveraging existing indigenous networks, institutions, and organizations. So going to those organizations that are already there, that already exist. So as scientists, your networks are, understand that your networks are very important, you know, to understanding the complex um, social system and system that you work in. But as indigenous peoples, they're equally complex social and governance systems as well. So the other aspect of communications is communicating about the project. So communities will most likely need support in capacity. And again, capacity you know, refers to a number of things to use, to prepare, to distribute, and implement results from a project. And so in both cases, communication should be culturally appropriate and understandable. It'll be very important to use plain language in reaching a common understanding. And in many cases, this might require translation. It also might require clear, transparent, culturally appropriate terms of reference. And both of these will help to ensure that there are no misunderstandings and this in the long term will also help with relationship building. The next part of this inner ring uh, is problem definition. So scientists as well as indigenous people and indigenous people's knowledge holders need to be jointly working together to identify the problem that's going to be addressed through the co-production of knowledge process. So defining the problem is something that um, those of you who are scientists and researchers do all the time. Um, you see a problem out in the world, you figure out what it is, you write grants for how to address them, and through a co-production process, everyone needs to be involved in that process of identifying what the problem is. There needs to be substantial leadership from indigenous people and indigenous people's knowledge holders, and that's really important throughout the project. <clears throat> We suggest that it might be helpful to have some sort of forum or process for identifying issues of mutual concern that can help lead towards um, an actual research project. And 
just as a brief example, <clears throat> when CORIC's social science program embarks on research projects with our communities, um, there are various ways that we try and work together with our tribes to find out what they see as problems and how we can help address them through, specifically through research activities. So um, one of the things we do is we just listen. When we're out in communities, we're always listening to what are people um, having concerns and issues about. We meet with tribal councils and ask them specifically what are issues and concerns that they're seeing. Um, we have various gatherings throughout the year at Coeric, some of which are um, sometimes specifically oriented towards making a, a list of priorities, priority concerns. Um, there's a variety of different ways you can do it, but the important part is making sure that it's not just you as one person or you as your organization deciding what might be important to people. Uh, there has to be that relationship and that trust and that conversation about what is important and what is the problem that everyone wants to collaboratively agree to address together. And when you go through that kind of process, uh, your, the problems that you identify, the issues that you come to understand are going to be much richer and um, typically I would say that your, your grant proposals and the work that you do is going to be much more of much more utility to people than you just you know, sitting in your office by yourself saying, aha, I see a problem and now I'm going to try and address it. So the next uh, piece that I'm going to talk about is identifying the question. And this is something that, so my background um, in um, Western education, I studied marine mammal biology and ecology. And so I have a, you know, I gained a not sound understanding of, you know, the scientific process and scientific methodology, you know, and one of the things, you know, that, that was of note was how, how you identify a research question and how those are formulated. Um, many times the research questions identified, you know, before you even have an idea of where you want to work or even, you know, the, the geographic location because you're studying, you know, a very important question. Um, but in the co-production of knowledge framework, it's going to be very important to ensure that both experts from both knowledge systems are working together collaboratively in determining what the question is. And so respecting different knowledge systems and different ways of asking questions might also result in a stronger research question than using scientific modes of inquiry alone. So for example, indigenous knowledge may shed light on other connections within a system that may not be readily apparent. And so, you know, it's important to remember to go into identifying questions very collaboratively because what might be that initial question that you might be asking as a scientist, you know, may have more complexities that could be better informed, you know, by um, indigenous people's knowledge systems and using different approaches at identifying, you know, what, what that question might be. So the next, next part of that inner ring has to do with developing methods. Um, here it's really important to recognize that indigenous people's knowledge systems holds its own methodologies. It's important to determine that what methods should be used. This may mean using methods from both science and indigenous people's knowledge systems or one or the other to answer different questions. Culturally appropriate methods to gather and analyze information should be agreed upon by both knowledge system experts before. So for example, we, consider, we can consider monitoring programs. It's very common for us to hear about the need to establish scientifically based monitoring programs without there first being recognition that indigenous peoples have been observing and monitoring their uh, environment for thousands of years and that oftentimes this is documented in various ways from songs to stories to, um, to everyday passing on of information through their indigenous knowledge system. Uh, these type of, the methodologies that are found within that are also oftentimes very much centered on the relationship between components as opposed to just individual components. So really looking at, at different variables that are being monitored um, than what the scientific method may, may be looking at. 
And this is another example of where it's really important to recognize that we're often answer, asking different questions and that both questions and both methods may be needed in order to have a holistic picture to see that entire puzzle of what's actually going on. The next part of the inner ring that we wanna talk about is gathering information. Experts from both knowledge systems should actively participate throughout all phases of a co-production of knowledge process, including the gathering of information. So as we were just speaking about um, when looking at the other components, for example, how the methods and questions um, are decided needs to be done collectively, uh, needs to be appropriate to the questions and problems at hand and to the people involved. And um, I think again, just to reiterate that this perhaps sounds linear as we're discussing these different pieces of, of the process. But again, just because you know, you've gone through all these different um, phases and are, are at the phase where you're actively gathering information, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't go back now periodically um, throughout the process to look at the question that you're asking and say, well, as, as a group collectively, well, is this still the right question to be asking? Are these still the right methods to be using? Um, are we all still satisfied with the ethical principles and protocols that we're following? So um, again, just to emphasize that even at stages such as data gathering, information gathering, um, it's still important to go back and revisit all of these other um, components of the process to make sure um, the equity is being implemented and that um, everyone is satisfied and happy with how the process is going. The, the next component of that inner ring we'd like to talk about is analysis. And that this was a really good time for Julie to remind us um, that this isn't a linear process and that we need to continuously go back and ensure that the intent is there for building equity and continuously reevaluating and re-asking, is this, are we doing the right approach? Do we need to adjust this? How do we adjust this? And being very flexible in that way. One thing that we see often left out from uh, collaborations or partnerships is uh, the lack of involvement of, of indigenous knowledge holders in the analysis process. And this is, again, where you wanna go back and say, uh, are we doing everything we need to be doing to create an equitable environment here that allows for that um, inclusion of the analysis process? So, so here we just really want to emphasize that both knowledge holders are needed to be involved in the analysis of information. This is about bringing together knowledge and creating something new. This requires both knowledge holders at every point. So Julie, I think you were gonna uh, discuss review of results next. Sorry, can everybody still hear me? Yep. 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 Okay, I'm not sure if maybe we lost uh, Julie. Julie, are you still there? I see okay, her. I'm, on, I'm gonna... I see her, but maybe she's lost audio. Okay, I'm just gonna jump in for you, Julie, and just jump back when, when you can hear us. So the next point that Julie was gonna discuss was reviewing results. Um, so how we draft results need to be access accessible to everyone to have the opportunity to review and give feedback that is incorporated. Uh, this is part of the process, uh, is vi this, this is part of a process that is vital to a co-production uh, approach or process. Uh, Rochelle? Yeah, and I, it looks like Julie was booted off and she'll try to join us. So hopefully she'll join us for once we start the discussion. Um, but the last component that we'd like to talk about in that inner ring is actually something that um, we added um, at a, you know, as we've been talking about this and sharing this model um, with our with colleagues and um, other, other people. And um, so the next one is practicing reciprocity. And this was introduced by Melinda Chase, you know, when she was talking about, you know, trust and respect and what trust and respect meant. 
And so the practice of reciprocity, you know, it's important in everyday practice for many indigenous communities in the Arctic. And so it goes beyond the two-way exchange for mutual benefit. So it's very much defined by traditional practices of sharing. So sharing of knowledge, sharing of experience, sharing of food, sharing of traditions. And so this process should be mutually beneficial to both parties. And in the context of research, you know, historically, you know, research has been, you know, very ex extractive. So with information, you know, that includes people's knowledge, the information that people, you know, might collect in um, monitoring West through a Western science lens. So information taken away and interpreted, you know, from a Western worldview. And research practices in a co-production of knowledge approach, you know, should provide reciprocal benefits you know, for both parties. So for example, you know, research questions should satisfy questions that are arising from an indigenous lens and not only of that of interest to scientists, you know, that might be thousands of miles away so that both gain benefit and, you know, knowledge from addressing that question. Um, and so it m might also, you know, go to just other practices about, you know, that might not be knowledge based, but are just in, you know, sharing you know, sharing information about yourself and building relationships. And it goes to um, ensuring that you have trust and respect in the long term. This is Julie. Can anyone hear me? Yeah, thanks. Oh, I'm glad you're back. I, I don't know what's going on. I couldn't get in by phone, but I'm, I'm here via my computer. Okay, so we're just coming to the, the conclusion and wanting to open this up for discussion before our closing comments. Um, so we, we would love to hear um, everybody's thoughts on any of these components for the entire process um, and, and discuss how to build towards, and even if you would like to share something about your thoughts on what you might be able to do within your own work, within your own activities to be building towards that equity that would allow for a co-production of knowledge process. Um, are there any thoughts that anyone would like to share? You can use the chat box too. Yeah, thank you. I was just gonna say I'll, I'll uh, decrease this so that we can, so I can see the chat box. Actually, Meredith, I'm, I'm not able to see the chat box, are you? I yes. Yeah. Okay. I can monitor. Thank you. So Carolina and, and Julie and Rachel, thanks. That was really an amazing presentation. This is Sarah Bowden from IARPIC. Um, I have a question under the trust and respect. And I'm, I'm wondering, do you, do you have an uh, experience of that issue flowing both ways, um, a lack of trust and respect from both sides in the co-production of knowledge, and if so, or is it just predominantly lack of trust and respect from um, indigenous peoples towards Western scientists? And if so, how do you address that if it's, if it's really two-way? Is it just through lots of conversation and just time and energy? Um, I can go, go first, so I think we'd all have kind of an answer with that, but, but I can go first. Um, I think in my own personal experiences, uh, well, I would say that there's a need for trust and respect on both sides. Um, but in my own personal experiences, what I've witnessed is the demonstration of lack in trust and respect towards the indigenous people at, at the table. And uh, oftentimes, um, this isn't even meant with intent, or it might it may be part of something that's so institutionalized that it's not, again, realized that that's what's actually taking place. Um, but, but I have many, many examples of, of uh, indigenous colleague or friend sharing information that was then met with eye rolling or scoffing or being dismissed immediately. 
and that right away hurts. It hurts when that happens, right? And so right away you see that establishment of lack of trust and respect. But we also have to look at what type of uh, institutional structures we have and if, if they're supporting uh, a trust and respectful um, environment. And that's why we say that all of these components are so interrelated with each other. Uh, but to, to give one solid example, um, Julie, uh, Rochelle and I, along with some other colleagues, facilitated a session at the last Arctic Observing Summit. And, and in that session, we set it up uh, where there were uh, three or four sessions for the continued conversation. And the intent of the conversation was to build up to a final conversation where we pretended like equity was there so we could have a discussion on co-production of knowledge process. But when we got to that point, there wasn't enough trust or respect in the room towards the indigenous peoples to even pretend that, that, we had, that we could move towards a discussion on that process. And that became, I think for myself, that's when it became really loud of what a huge obstacle that was. Uh, Rochelle and Julie, I, I don't know if you have some thoughts on it also. Um, yeah, definitely. And, and similar to Carolina, I feel like most of my examples and per and even personal experiences, you know, are um, lack of trust and respect, you know, towards scientists and, and especially policymakers and resource managers um, in, in the latter case. And, um, you know, one of the challenges too, I, I feel like is that, you know, a lot of indigenous peoples, you know, are trying to also translate some of these concepts and, and um, ideas to English, right? And so everything is also presented in this, you know, English framework that, and so a lot of things are lost, you know, from a Western perspective. And sometimes um, they are also misunderstood, you know, because of those types of challenges. And so I, I've, I've seen that, I've seen that happen as well. Um, and, you know, and it, you know, maybe, you know, one of the potentially, you know, potentially, you know, good things might be if, um, you know, it might be good practice, you know, at a conference to, you know, maybe in the host city that you're in, in the future to, see what it, indigenous people live there, look at the language and maybe try and have like, you know, a session that actually is in that language. And, and it, would, it would be interesting from the scientist or policy perspective, you know, to see, you know, how, you know, how difficult sometimes it is to translate. Yeah, this is Julie. I think I would just echo everything that, that Carolina and Rachel just said. Um, we have a question in the chat box, which can I, can, I follow, can I follow up on, on that comment for a second? This is Will yes, Amber. Um, I was in the room, um, Carolina, at that meeting at the Observing Summit, and, and I agree that was, it was unfortunate that the discussion didn't progress to where you wanted it to go. Um, and I, I don't want to single out you know, either side um, for, the, for the behavior, but, but I will say that um, there were uh, a number of indigenous people who actually displayed a shocking lack of trust of scientists. So I, I think it goes both ways. And I've, I've worked closely with people in Kutzebue and, and so I, I understand exactly what you're talking about here. But in that particular case, and I can only think that that is a, was a microcosm of larger issues, there wasn't a couple of um, comments that, that still stick in my mind, uh, a remarkable lack of trust um, coming from the indigenous people towards the scientists as well. So it, it goes both ways. Yeah, it, it, will, it definitely goes both ways. And in, in, in this discussion, um, people, the, the people's comments, they were reacting to a discussion that had happened outside of our session. Um, but that exemplified already, how do I say, like, it was, uh, it became this circular, it became this kind of circular uh, point, right, where um, the indigenous peoples didn't feel trusted or respected and it felt like, oh, here it goes, just a, more of the same kind of conversation. And, and then further said, well, I can't trust you because you're, you're not trusting me. Yeah, okay, no, of, yeah, yeah. No, 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 I, yeah. I, I see the point. I just, you know, I, I, I think it was, there was mistrust on both sides of that discussion. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Julie, I can't see the comment box. Would you mind 
Yeah, yeah. I, I'll just add one brief thing to, to what you all were just saying too, which, which is that um, I think we need to keep in mind that yes, it does go both ways and that oftentimes indigenous communities or indigenous people may have quite strong distrust towards the scientific community and I think that a lot of that is very well founded and based on a long history of interaction between those two groups and um, I would hope that in both cases it, it, the respect part is still able to be maintained but uh, there's a very very good reason solid you know based in history in the Bering Strait region in particular I'm speaking about where um, there's good reason for that from indigenous communities. But I, I did want to get to this question in the chat box or comment really from Diane Hirschberg. Um, she says that we recently had a discussion about funding organizations supporting the activities that would lead to genuine co-production of knowledge, but that, um, oops, sorry here, but that timelines of federal RFPs and grant funding tends to work at cross purposes with creating um, really collaborative and respective processes and outcomes. And um, I think that's a really important observation is that, um, you know, funders, whether they be federal or state or private funders play a really large role in um, this process of, you know, co-production of knowledge and science and, and all of these things. And, um, the responsibilities of funders, I think, are starting to change over time and funders are beginning to recognize this. And so I think that's one, one community that we need to make sure is involved in all of these conversations about co-production is the, the funding community so that they can see, you know, what good research looks like, what good collaboration and good co-production looks like, and that it can be very time intensive and um, particularly at the beginning, not always, but particularly at the beginning, it can involve a lot of face time um, between the people that are going to be working together and that it's important to have that supported in various ways, including through funding. So um, thanks, Diane, for that observation. Um, did either of you want to add anything about that? Well, no, I think it's very apt because um, in, in listening to what both you and Will said and going back to, to, I think part of Sarah's question was even what, what can be done, what are some of the things to be done about that, and remembering that in this uh, concept model for CPK, that there's all these different tools that we need to be using in order to address some of those issues. And relationship building is key to addressing the trust and respect issue. Um, and funding is needed for physical face-to-face -face meetings to aid in that relationship building. So I think that's all very um, interconnected. And, and I'll add one quick thing onto that. Um, I, I think this is where also it's important to remember, you know, the process and how we get to research and how, you know, federal um, agencies also get to research. And I think this is where, you know, the policy plays a very important role. And so, you know, in setting, you know, whether, you know, whether you're, you know, setting, you know, guidance, you know, for overall agencies or whether, you know, you're, you know, working on legislation, either, either way, you know, that will be an important place to also ensure that you're going to um, go the right way in the long run. And so a, a lot of times, you know, that aspect, you know, isn't included or forgotten. Mm -hmm. uh, this is Andre Petrov. I know, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Hi, go right yeah, ahead. Yeah, 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 just uh, happy to hear all your voices. Just want to say that one of the ways to address what Diane is talking about is to um, engage professional associations as a force to institutionalize some of these things within funding agencies or within the disciplines themselves, right? And so IAS is a, hopefully, um, it could be a good example of that. You know, we have established a ta task force that looking into this, how we as association could help. And, you know, we've, we've had several conversations since ICAS in June on where we find our place in, in promoting the process, ensuring uh, that co-production is becoming a key part of methodologies on 
both Western science and indigenous knowledge sites. I think that's an important element for us to do. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Andre. That's a really good point. Um, one thing I did want to say that I, I didn't a few minutes ago too, though, was that I, I think we need to be bringing these, these points um, to light about, you know, working with disciplinary organizations, working with funding institutions and organizations. Those are all very important, um, but they're, we don't want anyone to use that as, um, I guess I would say an excuse for not still not pursuing co-production processes um, right now and from the beginning. And there are many people, some of you on the phone, I'm sure are, are people who have done this and or know colleagues who have been doing effective co-production work for a really long time um, without perhaps some of some of that institutional and funding support that we're talking about now. So it's important that we still pursue um, this goal of co-production while at the same time working for um, more support in a variety of different ways, capacity to be built in a variety of different ways um, through other means as well. Uh, this is Will. Just to follow up on that, um, all these are really good ideas, but you know, when, when you finally come down to it, um, the person writing the proposal needs, needs to make the case that they will get a better answer and a more insightful answer to the research questions posed by using um, co-production than by not. I mean, you know, you can get professional organizations to say this, you can um, talk to granting agencies, um, but ultimately in the proposal you write, um, as a as a PI, you need to make the case that this is going to be a better result, um, you know, using this method than not. And along those lines, I would encourage um, uh, PIs to actually have on the grant proposals um, indigenous peoples as um, PIs, not just as people we're going to go talk to. That's, that's fantastic, Will. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking when you were saying that is um, there's no reason why an Indigenous knowledge holder can't be a co-PI on, on an NSF grant or a, another grant. Um, and that, that right again um, starts, to, starts it from the very beginning of you're planning the project together, your partners together from the very beginning. That's right. And it also, also an important side aspect of that is that, you know, uh, if they're included on a project, <clears throat> then they also should be paid, right? And, and that's, that's a, another, ver another issue, but, um, you know, you can't expect people to contribute their knowledge to a project uh, and not get, get compensated. Well, exactly. Yeah. You can't have an equitable process if, you know, half of the team is getting paid for their work and the other isn't or, or isn't being um, compensated fairly. So absolutely. Yeah, so I Good morning, I Karen and others. Great. Um, this is Mayor Brower from the North Slope Board. I just had a few more minutes. I just wanted to share an observation. I, I really enjoyed the presentation in regard to this effort in, in looking to that co-production co uh, development moving forward. You know, I think there are some examples that could be identified with here in terms of the past experiences we've had and learned from here in the Arctic. I think the Naval Arctic Research is one uh, subject that could be identified that included both sides, researchers, international researchers, and local people working together and compensated for, for, the, for the activity that was occurring and the research that was occurring at the same time. The other comment I wanted to share in regards to research, sometimes the risk is not even being considered to the people that subsist of these resources in terms of the impact that come from the research. Uh, and that's something I just wanted to share to keep mindful of people conducting research from, you know, international or whether it be from the United States, there's impacts that associated with these types of research and the availability of food resources to their user groups is, is not even considered in the sense when there's an impact. I just want to make that, share that observation from past experiences, just more recent past experiences. And, and like I said, it's had a few minutes and I wanted to share this observation with you. Thank you very much. Can I talk to me about it? 
Okay, um, we're in, in consideration of everybody's time, we're going to go ahead and start to wrap up this discussion. Um, be before I go to Julie and Rochelle for closing thoughts, were there any other comments that um, any of the other people on the phone with, or the computer would like to share? So, Carolina, there's a comment from Alona in the chat, um, and she asked about the guidelines and et ethical principles for conducting research, um, which ones we use, and are there standard ones for all Arctic regions? And I know that Renee Crane is on the line and Sarah Bowden also, who are working on the revision of the principles document, so they might speak to that, um, and also um, anyone else. Hey, this is Renee. Um, yes, yeah, so there is a set of principles for how researchers ought to conduct themselves in the Arctic that was released by the Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee, which are all of the federal agencies that support research in the Arctic. And the original was released in 1990. So because so many things have changed since then, including our approaches to working with indigenous communities, we're revising those principles um, and actually in a couple of weeks, we will release a revised version of them that's based on a lot of input we collected starting last fall. Um, and so th those are intended to provide, you know, the expectations that we have of researchers who go to the Arctic in particular, um, uh, can include researchers who already live in the Arctic, of course, um, but it's largely aimed at people who are maybe less familiar with working with communities and um, the expectations that the federal agencies have or how they comport themselves and interact. And it, it really circles back to um, the trust issue that was being talked about earlier and the respect for indigenous cultures and developing communication. Um, the principles document doesn't specifically talk about conflict and being able to have those difficult conversations and talk about past hurts and um, you know, really get things out on the table and resolve them, which I think is, you know, is necessary in some cases. And in other cases, people really already have a great deal of trust and respect. And, and so the principles are developed to be very broad and apply to all types of research. And then hopefully within, it, you know, sort of provides a, a method for people to um, interact and a reminder of the behavior that's expected. And Renee, if I could just clarify one point, and that is that um, they're going to be released as part of a federal register notice for public comment in a couple weeks. Um, and there'll be a 60 day public comment period. Yeah, and I, I think I would just add to that, that many uh, communities and regions across the Arctic have their own um, ethical guidelines or protocols. Um, so, so, for example, the Wildlife Department um, at the North Slope Rail has their own. Um, the uh, Inuvialuit Settlement Region has their own. Um, and also that, that we do need to consider that there does need to be maybe put forward some protocols put forward by Indigenous peoples themselves. Mm -hmm. um, on what they think is necessary. And, and I know from working in the international arena, there's a large need for overarching international kind of protocols or processes, uh, I'm not sure what you would call it, to be put forward by indigenous peoples themselves. That's a great point, Carolina, and this is Renee again, and I just wanted to follow up by saying, because there, there exists some really great documents, that when we were revising the principles that are put out by the federal agencies, we, we relied a lot on referencing and, and reading things that communities have put out as, um, you know, a really important thing to refer to and to build the, the principles that the agencies are putting out around. And this document, uh, this figure that we're looking at too, is another way of looking at, you know, and, and taking a cross cut at the similar concepts of what we're trying to accomplish in working together. Mm -hmm. That's great, Renee. Um, um, be before I close up, were there any other um, thoughts? So I'll, I'll just ask Julie if she has any closing thoughts she would like to share. I um, just want to thank everybody for calling in and participating today. And please do feel free to contact Carolina or Rachel or I if you have any questions about anything we talked about today. If you have a specific project that you have questions about, 
or um, if you know of other venues where it might be useful to um, have this kind of presentation and discussion. If we have a much longer format one we can do as, as well as the shorter one we did today and we're happy to continue these conversations. So thank you. Thank you. Rochelle, did you have any closing comments? Uh, I just wanted to thank um, the folks from the region and all of the, you know, interested and supportive um, scientists for joining the call today. Um, and I also wanted to say that, you know, I feel like, uh, you know, a lot of us, you know, work um, at institutions that are very rigid and very, you know, difficult to make institutional change. But I think there's also a challenge there as individuals for each of us to do what we can to advance this. And, you know, it, it, all it takes is one, one person to make some change. And so thank you all. I think this is a good starting place for that by joining this, so thank you. Yeah, that, thank you everybody for, for joining. Um, uh, uh, as Julie said too, that we, we do have a longer um, conversation that, that we could structure on this. And part of this point is having uh, conversations that might not be so comfortable all the time, right? And, and feeling ready to put forward and kind of talk through some of these issues such as trust and respect and to be able to get to trust and respect. And so in follow-up to what both Julie and Rochelle said, we, we would like to uh, ask you to be reflective of this talk and to ask yourselves, uh, what could you do to advance the co-production of knowledge process to build equity? Um, in your work, please think about what you can be doing to bring together science and um, indigenous people's knowledge systems and to consider what you can be learning and how does this framework apply to to your work. Um, and, and again, we, we are really grateful for um, the Coastal Resilience Collaboration team for providing us with a platform to share this with all of you and to start this discussion and realize that it's just the start of a discussion and, and uh, really encourage you to follow up with any of us to continue the discussion. But we also have this space on IARPIC that we can continue the discussion as well. Uh, so with, with that, if there's no other Last comments, I'll just say koyana and, and have a, a wonderful day. <laughs>